Thanks, Ed. Uh, that was um, really um, very comprehensive. Thank you for that history tour as well. It, it can never uh, stop learning about the state treasures uh, in this great garden state. I should just say uh, we met with a successful entrepreneur, an alum recently. His name is Bill Lockwood, who um, serves the pharmacy industry. And he, his father used to work at BD. In fact, he worked at BD. And he would go on and on the whole lunch, in fact, about BD and what a great company it is. And um, so um, really just a great, uh, admirable co uh, company. Thank you very much. Another state treasurer is Kathleen Coviello. She is uh, standing in for Angie McGuire, who was um, called away to the governor's office, probably for another, another budget crisis. Um, many of you may know Kathleen. Uh, she's from the NJEDA, heads the uh, Life and Health Sciences uh, Department or division. She has uh, been uh, among the banking and venture community for many years. She's a friend. And in fact, when they called yesterday, I said, uh, they said, who do you want? I said, well, at first I said Karen Franzini, but she was out of, the, uh, out of the office. She's on our board. I said, next, I said Kathleen Coviello. So I'm pleased to have Kathleen. If you, don't, if you don't get a chance to meet her, please follow up with her sometime. She really is a great supporter of business in this state. Kathleen? Good morning. Thrilled to be here, and Jim, thank you for your kind comments. Um, I'm going to apologize because I usually don't look off notes too often, but I got the phone call at quarter after five last night and then had to run to a t-ball field, so uh, <laughs> please be patient with me. Um, consider, uh, continuing on the theme of innovation, really I wanted to share with you all um, some of the great innovation that's going on in the state of New Jersey. And, um, you know, I think uh, we're hardest on ourselves and it's, it's always good to sit back retrospectively and hear some of the successes. Um, and Ed's comments this morning and the, the history of BD um, really is, is near and dear to my heart. As Jim said, I've been um, running up and down the state of New Jersey uh, for about the last 15 years working with early stage tech and life science companies and, and joined uh, the Economic Development Authority almost three years ago now because I'm, I'm really passionate and believe that there is so much innovation in this state and so much opportunity for us to make a difference um, either in technology or life sciences in the state. So when I'm out in the marketplace talking to companies that are thinking of moving to New Jersey or um, are looking to grow in New Jersey, the first question um, they always say is, well, well, why New Jersey? And I think one of the, the funny things and, and the easy answers is because we're in between Pennsylvania and New York. Um, so we don't have our own identity sometimes, but it's also a benefit to us in that uh, it allows us access to um, some very strategic markets uh, in a very very easy travel uh, day um, to, to go and tap into the talent pool or the financing um, transactions in New York or in Philadelphia. And uh, also interestingly is the heavy population in the state of New Jersey. So there's more than 60 million U.S. consumers in the state of New Jersey, uh, which is very different when you look in the Midwestern states, obviously. So it's good to be close to where your customer is, uh, and with the, the current gas prices will, will make an important impact on your bottom line in helping get your product to your end customer. And then, you know, I think the other, other great supporting factor for being in this state is the highly skilled workforce. Uh, we have a terrific university system, in, including Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, we are fifth in terms of college attainment um, and 15th in uh, the U.S. in terms of Ph.D. scientists and engineers. And those are very important statistics. Uh, and when a company chooses to locate here, they're looking at where they're going to grow their employee base from. And, and we hear it over and over again, you know, the talent pool is here. It's hard to attract great talents. You know, you heard Ed, he's been with BD 30 years. I mean, that type of loyalty and knowledge knowledge base is so key to innovation in companies uh, within the state of New Jersey. Uh, the quality of life also. Uh, CNBC uh, 
ranked New Jersey America's top state for business um, as, as the number one state for business. So I think, uh, again, it's nice to tout those wins um, when we have them. Uh, the Kauffman Foundation, which many of you know uh, ranks entrepreneurialism around the United States, uh, ranks New Jersey number two in leading uh, the country's economic transformation and number six according to employment growth. Um, and um, it's a, a sign, this employment growth, of dynamic and adaptive changes in the state economy. And, and that really brings me to something I spend most of my day on, um, which is executing on Governor Corzine's economic growth strategy. So when Governor Corzine came on board, he realized the need really to pull together the resources and increase the state resources for early stage technology and life science companies. Uh, and with uh, the Corzine administration, we launched something called the Edison Innovation Fund. And the EDA is a lead partner in executing on that in conjunction with the Commission on, on Science and Technology and the Commission on Higher Ed. And I'm going to brag a little bit and share some of the stats with you. Since October of 2006, when we launched the Edison Innovation Fund, we've committed $250.5 million uh, to early stage technology and life science companies looking to grow their business uh, in the state of New Jersey. And that support has helped 368 companies. So th that's a, a pretty palatable number considering the fiscal crisis we're in in this state. $250.5 million since October 2006. I think it, it deserves repeating. Um, there are a number of different initiatives under that umbrella, and uh, we've tried to structure a, um, a, a bountiful list of products so that we can help different companies depending on the different stages of their life cycle. So we make direct investments through the EDA into early stage technology and life science companies, and we've committed to 17 companies. So we understand that that uh, early capital to help those companies grow their business and get their product out into the market is the hardest resource uh, for early stage companies. Um, so 17 companies have received direct funding from the EDA under the Edison Innovation Funds. We also have a program, which many of you may read about in the paper, to attract businesses to grow in New Jersey called our Business Employment Incentive Program. In, in, since the launching of the Edison Fund, we've helped 30 technology and life science companies with pure grants of $68.9 million under that initiative. And then, and then the one that might be near and dear to many of you in this room is the Net Operating Loss Program. We allow uniquely in New Jersey companies to sell their, their losses for cash. Uh, this is non-dilutive funding, which to the founding entrepreneur who's so innovative um, is key. They don't want to give up their, their business. Uh, so again, a way to monetize those losses early on and fund future development. There's no requirements on how the dollars are, are spent, you know, which is a, is a great attribute to the company and the founder as well. So we've had two rounds of that funding under the Edison Fund since Governor Corzine came on board, and, and his administration was with us at the um, NJTC Venture Conference, and one of the members of the audience said, please don't make don't let that program go away in the budget cuts. Um, and, and we received a strong endorsement that, no, we hear you loud and clear. This is important to this community in helping you survive and, and really get off the ground. Um, and under that program, 220 companies have benefited from that um, during uh, Governor Corzine's administration. So I think, um, again, a, a very, very strong tool in helping early stage companies. Uh, on, our, on our more traditional programs that we have at the EDA, we've helped 13 companies uh, for $27 million. And then I think not to be ignored is our sister agency, the New Jersey Commission on Science and Technology. Uh, they have um, a, a laundry list of initiatives to help early stage technology and life science companies. And since the launch of the Edison Innovation Fund, have assisted 88 companies. And that comes in the form of pure grants, grants to keep Keep technology um, here in the state of New Jersey. We have postdoctoral graduates from the state universities who can be funded to work in a New Jersey company. So we want to make sure that when we're educating these folks, that they're staying here and adding value um, into our early stage companies. One of the unique side benefits that we've seen from that program is that the companies are really learning what's going on in our research universities in the state. We have individuals who have been working. Um, in the labs, in the universities, and then go out to private 
private industry, and they're really helping make that connection. So it's really, in addition to the dollars, the cross-fertilization that happens um, within the state. There is um, seed funding for the incubators. I know we have a number of incubator managers um, in the room. And um, again, capital is always the key for these companies and how they get up and running. Um, and so a number of companies has, have benefited from that as well. Um, so I, I, you know, again, very good statistics, more room to grow and improve in the state, and we're working hard to get there. Um, and, and we welcome your support and feedback on that. I would like to share um, a few, uh, actually just two success stories recently that you may have seen about in the news. And one is Nova Nordis. So last week, Nova Nordis announced its plans to expand its headquarters in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, the company's leased an additional 167,000 square feet across the road from its existing North American headquarters and will add 400 jobs to its current workforce in the um, region of 800 already. Uh, if, for those of you that are not familiar with Nova Nordisk, it's a healthcare company with an 85-year history of innovation and achievements in diabetes care. The company's broad diabetes products uh, in the portfolio include the most advanced products within the area of insulin delivery systems. The support from the state for Nova Nordis um, came in the form of some advocacy services. So we helped coordinate all of their land and permitting requirements. We worked with the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, I'm sorry, Department of Environmental Protection, um, the EDA support, and labor. We also gave them a grant called a Bragg grant for $420,000. They're receiving sales and use tax exemption totaling $1.3 million. They got something called our Business Employment Grant, which I mentioned um, under the Edison Fund for $5.4 million. Um, and uh, just also important to note is that Nova Nordis opened its first of kind uh, hemostasis research center in the technology center uh, on Route 1 in New Brunswick. So a great success story and a real win for New Jersey uh, and a testimonial to the talent as well as the financial resources and support from the state. Um, also, it, just building on, um, on the earlier comments, you know, part of this initiative is really to help build the public-private partnerships in the state. So we heard about Colonel Dickinson and his $30,000 uh, leveraged uh, to get a college named after him in New Jersey. Under the Edison Innovation Fund, we're really looking for that public-private leverage um, in all that we do. Um, and I think uh, our speaker that I'll introduce in a moment um, from Merck has done a tremendous job of demonstrating that leverage. Um, Merck is building partnerships all across the state and has really transformed themselves into an externally focused company. Uh, globally, uh, Merck has entered into 140 partnerships of different kinds in the last three years. So I think, again, that theme of partnership, leveraging, looking externally are all key to um, innovation, both for companies and for the state of New Jersey. Um, and, and uh, we're going to be introduced in just a minute to Dr. Mervyn Turner, who is the S Senior Vice President of Worldwide Licensing and External Research at Merck. Uh, Dr. Turner uh, joined Merck Research Laboratories in 1985 and over the last 22 years has held many positions of increasing responsibility. In August of 1999, Dr. Turner was appointed Senior Vice President at Merck Frost Center for Therapeutic Research in Montreal, Canada. Dr. Turner returned from his assignment, we're glad to have him back, um, in October 2002 to take up his current position as Senior Vice President of Worldwide Licensing and External Research. In this role, he's responsible for the oversight of all Mark's licensing activities and for the management of academic relations. Through his multiple and diverse experiences in the Merck Research Laboratories, Dr. Turner has acquired a broad perspective on the issues surrounding drug discovery and development. Please welcome me, join me in welcoming Dr. Turner. Thank you very much, Kathleen. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here today and have the opportunity to talk to you. It's also very nice to, uh, uh, to be following Ed Ludwig. I'd like to um, recognize both a professional and a personal connection to, uh, to Becton Dickinson. 
Uh, of course, professionally, our last CEO, uh, Ray Gil Martin, came to us from, uh, uh, from Beckton Dickinson. Uh, and uh, I can tell you my personal story, which is that uh, in 1971, I first uh, came to the States to do postdoctoral research at uh, Harvard University, and I was doing uh, research on uh, uh, a, um, a cell surface marker on lymphocytes. I, I had to prepare lymphocytes every day from freshly drawn blood, 10 mils of blood every day. Uh, and I found there were very few volunteers for this. So uh, I quickly learned uh, to, uh, to, to do, it, do it myself, to draw 10 mils of my own blood every day, and I became uh, very expert with a vacutainer. Uh, and actually, I still have a little set of track marks on my <laughs> left forearm, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. Okay. So... Um, you, um, no doubt it hasn't escaped your attention that these are, uh, these are pretty tough times for, uh, for Merck. Uh, they're pretty tough times for the whole uh, pharmaceutical sector, uh, as a matter of fact. This is uh, an extremely difficult environment we're operating in, and there is only one way out, and, and that way out is through innovation. And uh, I'm going to tell you a, a story. It's a, it's a story about uh, Merck and how we've gone about uh, trying to transform ourselves to really leverage uh, innovation on, on a worldwide basis. Um, uh, Merck has a long and, uh, and storied history of, uh, of innovation. We are uh, very proud of our uh, reputation as innovators, but people used to think of us as a, a company that innovated internally. Uh, and so our, our big challenge has been to, uh, uh, to change Merck from, uh, uh, from an inwardly looking to uh, outward focused uh, organization. Uh, and that, that's involved a big uh, transformational shift for Merck, a big change in our, uh, uh, in our culture and, and our mindset. And I think we've been uh, very successful doing it. So really what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is how we try to uh, affect that change uh, and how we see the, uh, the results building. Okay, so uh, I can't give this presentation without uh, giving uh, uh, a forward-looking statement, uh, this presentation. <laughs> Uh, this presentation contains certain uh, forward-looking remarks, so and I would ask you to uh, read this statement and uh, digest. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, although we have, um, we have a, uh, uh, a reputation for being an inwardly focused organization, actually Merck has always been very successful at, uh, at licensing, uh, uh, going uh, way back uh, to uh, Roy Vagelos's time as a as CEO uh, when uh, we licensed in uh, what became a very successful drug. Uh, Pepsid uh, was uh, the third uh, antihistamine H1 blocker uh, available for, uh, uh, for the treatment of uh, gastric ulcers and, and of course is now available uh, uh, over the counter. Um, we, uh, we did a relationship with DuPont, which brought us a Cozar and Heizar. I'll tell you a little more about uh, our relationship with a tiny Italian company called Gentili, which brought us a drug called Fosamax, just gone off patent this year. We had a relationship with Curin in Japan, a, a, a quinolone antibiotic, naroxin. Uh, uh, actually, uh, all of our vac pretty much all of our vaccines have in them some uh, external component. Uh, Verivax, uh, Zostavax, uh, which is a herpes shingles vaccine. Uh, my personal story there is that uh, uh, Zostavax is, is approved for, uh, for the prevention of shingles uh, in uh, individuals over the age of uh, 60. Uh, and uh, uh, I was on the road once with Peter Kim, our president of, of research, and he described this as Merck's vaccine for the elderly, first vaccine for the elderly, and I was up next and had to admit I'd had my shot three days previously. So. <laughs> We've also, uh, we've also leveraged innovation through, uh, through very successful uh, joint ventures. Uh, Astra Merck, a joint venture. Together, we, uh, uh, we introduced Prilosec, which became uh, the world's number one selling drug. J&J uh, &J Merck, a joint venture in over-the-counter. DuPont Merck. Uh, 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 we have a vaccine joint venture with uh, Sanofi Aventis. Uh, we now have a joint venture in the animal health business. Obviously, uh, we have the Merck Shearing Plow alliances in both cardiovascular and respiratory medicine. Uh, and these have been uh, really tremendously uh, important to us. Uh, however, the fact was that uh, around the year 2000, we, we really saw the environment changing and that we had to uh, focus uh, uh, much more rigorously on, uh, on licensing. Um, we had 
um, a series of uh, upcoming patent expirations on, uh, on big products for us. Uh, we had uh, pipeline gaps. Uh, and we had uh, late stage development failures, uh, I'm afraid uh, something that's become uh, quite commonplace across the industry now. Um, and we also saw at that time uh, greatly improved quality in, uh, in biotech offerings. Uh, and uh, one of the things I like to talk about is uh, uh, what I refer to as the democratization of drug discovery. It used to be if you wanted to be in the drug discovery business, you had to come to a, a big pharma. We had the sample collections, we had, we had the libraries, we had the assays, uh, we had the medicinal chemistry, uh, which were really essential to uh, participate in small molecule drug discovery. That's changed. The velvet revolution in our business is really what's happened to uh, uh, medicinal chemistry, the way uh, chemistry is done, both in terms of uh, um, quantity of compounds that can be produced, quality and, uh, and amounts, um, uh, and uh, the way those compounds can be used in, uh, in assays which uh, can operate on the, on the micro scale. So uh, many small companies have taken advantage uh, of that uh, and have decided to participate in this, and we have to embrace that uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, participate in it by finding the best of what's available externally. Uh, and uh, uh, although we had this uh, successful history of, of partnering, uh, we, we weren't really out there. We were, uh, we were seen rather as uh, sitting by the telephone and waiting for people to call. Uh, and uh, uh, that obviously wasn't going to work in the future. Um, we, uh, we tried to license in uh, one new chemical entity uh, uh, every year, uh, uh, actually a goal that was uh, seldom met, very difficult. Uh, and uh, other companies such as uh, Bristol Myers and, and Pfizer were, uh, were both setting the pace for, uh, for multiple partnerships. Back then, uh, the competition for, uh, for deals uh, was much less uh, intent, intense. We found that, uh, uh, actually this was slides a couple of years old, so about seven years ago, 67% of the time uh, there were three or fewer companies involved in uh, licensing discussions. And it was rare that you would find um, five or four companies uh, participating uh, in a discussion and never uh, five to eight. That um, uh, has changed dramatically now. Uh, almost every time that we're involved in, uh, in licensing discussions in an environment where innovation is a scarce resource, uh, then most of the time uh, it is an auction process with, uh, with as many as eight players uh, involved in discussions with our uh, potential partners. So how are we going to uh, distinguish ourselves in that kind of setting? Licenses started to become uh, much more complicated. Uh, I mentioned Gentili, a little, uh, little Italian company uh, from whom we, uh, we licensed Alendronate, which became a, a hugely successful drug uh, called Fosamax, uh, uh, the most successful of the bisphosphonates for the treatment of, uh, and prevention of osteoporosis. And that was a very straightforward license back in uh, 1988, uh, 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 an up, an up, small upfront, uh, a small royalty, they had no downstream uh, participation. Um, today, of course, uh, licenses demand and they get uh, other terms. Um, they look for uh, co-promotion rights in certain markets. They may want sole marketing rights in, uh, in their home market. Uh, they want a voice. Uh, in the uh, development and, uh, and commercialization. Uh, uh, they, they, we have tremendous uh, debates and discussions with potential partners around uh, reversion rights. What happens if, uh, if this uh, relationship fails? And let's, uh, let's face it, most of what we do in the pharmaceutical industry fails, so you have to be uh, prepared for that. Uh, what kind of reversion rights will, uh, will, um, will go with uh, termination of an agreement, and how do, we, uh, how do we split the intellectual property? It's much more uh, complicated to uh, ne negotiate. So, uh, as I said, we had to evolve really from an inward looking to uh, an outward facing uh, uh, organization, which was, it was a big uh, transition uh, for Merck. Uh, it had to start with uh, senior, ma senior management, had to start with very strong messages from, uh, from the top of, of Merck. And it didn't just involve Merck research labs. There are uh, multiple uh, uh, elements within uh, the organization involved in licensing on the corporate side, uh, corporate licensing and business development, uh, our, uh, our patent department, our legal departments, the manufacturing division, sales, marketing, so on and so forth. Everyone really had to uh, uh, buy into this. 
and it involved this uh, uh, big uh, culture shift towards a, a mindset uh, which embraced um, partnering and it was really a, an attitudinal change that we were looking for and we had to make sure that people were then uh, rewarded and compensated for uh, appropriately adopting those kinds of uh, behaviors. We had to communicate what we were trying to do uh, very broadly. We had to change the, uh, the decision-making uh, mode at Merck. We found that, uh, that people really didn't know how, uh, how decisions got, uh, got made at Merck. Uh, I'm not surprised, many of us didn't know how decisions got made at Merck. Uh, we, we had to apply marketing principles, okay? Uh, as, again, we had to get a, a share of voice uh, in this uh, crowded marketplace. How are we really going to uh, distinguish ourselves? We worked very hard with the marketing group on that, and I'll show you some of the results. Uh, we had to make sure we had the right resources, we had to train people, and of course, uh, we had to uh, uh, get a set of metrics. How was this uh, really going to add to the bottom line? So uh, we, we, our approach to this was to start by looking at the whole landscape. Uh, we did uh, some internal and external benchmarking. We looked at uh, industry trends, and these spanned uh, two initiatives. One of the, thing, one of the things that we did was uh, we, we did a survey uh, in which we, uh, we sent out a blinded survey to, uh, to about 120 companies who were actual or potential partners of, uh, of Merck. Uh, and uh, uh, we asked them a bunch of questions, you know, what were they looking for in, uh, in a partner? Uh, and also, how would, they, uh, how would they rate Merck compared to uh, 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 four of our competitors? Um, as I say, this was, this was done blinded through, uh, through a third party. We got some terrific uh, feedback uh, from that, uh, which really um, uh, opened our eyes to how we were perceived uh, in, the, in the industry. Uh, and the kind of messages that we were sending out were, just weren't uh, appropriate. Essentially, the message that was being received by potential partners was, uh, we're great at Merck, come and talk to us. Um, uh, and uh, really, the message that we wanted to get out was, you're great, uh, we can work together with you to bring your product to the marketplace. Um, we, we worked on our processes, we developed an overall strategy for what we were trying to do. As I said, we worked on our people, our, uh, our information systems, uh, and uh, set in place uh, a change process to give us the leadership and culture we wanted, uh, and then uh, look back for results. We did uh, get a clear signal from the top. It started with Ray Gilmartin, uh, Dick Clark, our, our current CEO and president, uh, has uh, what we call the, the Merck plan to win, and uh, we're very emphatic in that, that uh, Merck's plan to win will embrace uh, partnerships. We will pursue partnerships and focused acquisitions that reinforce our, uh, our core business. Uh, and uh, both Ray and uh, Dick have been just tremendous uh, supporters and advocates for us, uh, and Dick comes on the road with us uh, several times a year uh, to address uh, potential partners and, and to meet with them one-in-one, -in -one. and in fact he offers a standing invitation, any Merck partner, any time that they come to White House Station, he will make time to have uh, lunch with them, uh, and a number of our partners have taken him up on that. Lunch at White House Station is no, uh, no bargain, I can tell you. But, uh, <laughs> the, the other concept, which uh, uh, we've used this slide for nine years uh, in, inside the labs, and we use it because it's a very powerful slide uh, for our uh, scientists. Uh, and, and what we're uh, telling them is, look, 99% of worldwide uh, biomedical research goes on outside the walls of Merck. Uh, you, we just can't expect that all the innovation is going to come from the 1% of research that we conduct uh, uh, internally. And what we want you to do as Merck scientists uh, is really build a virtual laboratory by, by mounting the very best scientific program that, that we can in your area, whether it comes from internal research or external collaboration uh, or both. And it's really, it's a very powerful message for a scientist. You know, one of the great things about science, what I love about science, is it's international in scope. Uh, scientists all around the world, uh, they speak the same language. They speak the language of science. It's the last true international language in my book. Uh, scientists uh, can, you know, can come from completely different countries. They look at the same data set on the same graph. Uh, then uh, they can talk about, uh, about the data. Uh, and also, it's, it's a recognition. The corollary to that is uh, ideas know no 
boundaries. They know no borders. They, they respect uh, uh, no, uh, no international borders. So you really have to uh, embrace the thinking uh, that uh, the world is our oyster, that there's a tr huge amount of innovation taking place in the world. How are we going to capture all that? And how are we going to have the mindset amongst our scientists that that's a good thing to do? Uh, and I would say that, that this, was a, this was key to us. That, and once we got the scientists turned on to this, uh, then uh, uh, that was a, a huge uh, win for us going forward. Um, Peter Kim is president of Merck Research. Uh, this is one of his favorite slides. This is his message when he's uh, out on the, on the stump with me. Uh, that our research and development strategy is about embracing partnerships. We have to have a strong internal research capability. We, we have about 5,000 interactions a year with, uh, with external parties. Uh, as you'll see, we, we're currently doing about 50 deals a year. So we have to have a really strong uh, uh, internal capability in, in order to be able to uh, winnow through those uh, 5,000 interactions to find those uh, 50 potential deals. Uh, and also the quality of our uh, internal research uh, is a real draw for uh, potential partners. Uh, and so we want to leverage that internal capability through collaborations, and we like our collaborations to be very open. We, we don't want to compete with, uh, with a partner. Some organizations actually set up um, to do that, but to really completely openly and transparently uh, share uh, uh, in a relationship, share the ideas, really uh, capture the best of what uh, everyone has to offer here. Uh, and uh, we have uh, set up a process where we can continually evaluate uh, potential transactions, those 5,000 interactions that we have every year involve everything from uh, platform technologies to, uh, to late stage uh, product opportunities. Uh, and we do this in a highly coordin coordinated way uh, all across the company. We, uh, one of the things that uh, we did internally was we did work on our process. I'm not going to uh, bore you with what the process is, um, but uh, we, we tried to make it transparent and straightforward and, and rapid to make sure we had uh, uh, access to the decision makers in the company. Uh, basically, there's just three elements to it, uh, opportunity identification, uh, deal execution, and then uh, managing the alliance. And we started with a huge advantage uh, uh, over our competitors. You can see at a glance that we're far more good looking than, uh, than that they are. <laughs> Young, that's right. Yeah. Uh, the other thing we did, which uh, uh, I think was a real, um, has been a real win for us, uh, is to build um, um, a, a scouting function uh, in, uh, in key locations all around the world. Now, our scouts, and I'll show you a picture of our scouts in a moment, they do not do deals. Uh, they build uh, relationships. Uh, and these are senior level Merck scientists. Uh, their job is uh, we, uh, we bury them in, the, in their local uh, community, uh, San Diego, San Francisco, Boston, wherever. Uh, and it's their job to build relationships with, uh, within that local scientific community, uh, with the academics, with, uh, with venture capitalists. We have um, very strong relationships with many of the VC firms uh, uh, and, uh, and with the biotech companies themselves. And, and they then are our uh, point of contact uh, for potential partners. And um, we've established uh, key locations uh, uh, all around the world, indeed. Uh, can't see these at the back, but these are uh, our, uh, our scouts and their, uh, their geographical uh, locations. Remember what Willie Sutton said, uh, Willie Sutton, the, uh, uh, the bank robber, when he was uh, asked by, uh, by the FDI, uh, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. Okay, so why do we have uh, scouts in, uh, in, 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 uh, in these different geographical locations? Because that's where the biotech community is. These are all centers of, uh, of innovation uh, uh, around the world. Uh, by the way, we don't ignore uh, uh, New Jersey. Of course, we have a very strong base here in, uh, uh, in New Jersey uh, and all up and down the, uh, the eastern seaboard. Uh, but, uh, but we use these, uh, these individuals, uh, they're, they're our uh, antenna uh, uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the world uh, outside Merck. Uh, they're the ones who, uh, who feed us uh, information on an ongoing basis uh, and uh, the, the, the local companies know that, that they've got a friend in San Diego or San Francisco, wherever it is uh, in China now, uh, that they can talk to about uh, what's going on at Merck. 
Um, and we do find uh, that uh, excellence in science uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, past five years, we've signed deals with uh, partners in the, these countries, uh, obviously uh, Canada and US, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Iceland, Italy, Sweden, Switzerland, the Netherlands, the UK, India, China, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand. Again, ideas know no boundaries. You have to have uh, the mindset and the capability to go out and find uh, innovation wherever it sits. Um, relationships. You know, in uh, our business, uh, the, the business of science, maybe all business, it's about people. Uh, and it, it's about uh, knowing people, uh, it's about building, uh, building trust, uh, uh, it's about those repeat calls, if you like. So, so building long-term relationships has become um, a company-wide activity for us. We, we hold regular partnering receptions, uh, at, for example, at the uh, uh, American uh, Cardiology Association or, uh, or the American Diabetes Association. We might have a reception where we invite current and potential partners uh, to come and talk with us. Uh, we, we arrange, obviously, for private meetings at, uh, at companies. Um, we, uh, we give a lot of uh, high-level uh, speeches about uh, our partnering activities. Um, uh, we sponsor conferences uh, all around the world. We, uh, we put up exhibits. We do a lot of prospecting. We, we go out doing a lot of uh, cold calling uh, to biotech companies. We keep a huge database uh, of biotech companies all around the world. When was the last time we talked to them? We make sure that we uh, f keep those companies uh, fresh. Uh, scientific meetings, uh, we really encourage our scientists to, uh, uh, to talk to their peers from other companies. Uh, we have a lot of meetings with venture capital companies. Uh, they uh, give us an overview of their portfolios. We, we participate on boards. Personal contacts at all levels are, are, are fostered. This is a really important uh, effort for us. With the goal of really, at the end of the day, leaving no stone unturned to uh, evaluate new opportunities. And we make sure that this is a, a key objective at all levels of the lab. We've worked very hard to prioritize uh, uh, our interests. Uh, Ed highlighted areas in, in which Becton Dickinson is not uh, active. Uh, we're the same. There are certain areas which are areas of high focus for us uh, and other areas which aren't. We weren't communicating that. Now we communicate that very clearly. You can go to Merck's website and you can see what we're working on. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, actually, what we do now is we prepare a list of what we call our wants and don't wants list that we, uh, we share with, uh, with companies, and they're just as interested in what we're not interested in as what we are interested in, because uh, uh, time's money, people don't want to waste their time talking to us about an area that's uh, not on our radar screen. So we, we try to screen all these opportunities. We try to be both uh, proactive and, and reactive. Uh, obviously, we're strategic. We have to be opportunistic as well, and we operate a system in each of our therapeutic areas of uh, so-called review and licensing committees where uh, we have over 200 Merck subject matter experts uh, sprinkled through these committees, and they, they review the opportunities that come in each month. We give a package of information to uh, the people on these teams, and we say, what, what do you want to do with this? Do you want uh, uh, is this yes, no, or uh, more information? If you want more information, we can go and sign a confidentiality agreement. Uh, and uh, we sign literally hundreds of confidentiality agreements every year. Uh, this, the, no one's interested in databases, but we have, uh, we have a, a, a remarkable uh, in-house database which allows us to track this. Uh, one of the things we discovered when um, uh, 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 some years back when, uh, when I started this was that uh, 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 we'd actually done the same deal twice with some companies. <laughs> Uh, this makes sure that doesn't happen. Um, uh, it also makes sure that we're, we're singing from the same hymnal. Uh, so we don't like to go in and, uh, and, and be surprised by, uh, by the fact that someone was uh, visiting from Merck two weeks ago, something like that. We developed a set of guiding principles. Uh, that uh, our alliances are driven by strategic priorities. We don't set floors or ceilings for what we're trying to do. We've set up an incentive system. Uh, we look at transactions in all stage of research and development. We're, f we're, s we're fast, we're flexible, uh, and we focus on, uh, on creating value and leveraging the, the strengths of each partner in a long-term relationship. Some of our uh, relationships last longer than most marriages. <laughs> it's, it's true. You know, we, we have a, a drug that's in phase three now, CAT-K inhibitor. Uh, uh, MK822, 
uh, and that started as a, as a collaboration in 1996. Uh, very customer oriented. Uh, uh, we didn't have a reputation for, uh, for being customer oriented. We really listen to what it is our customers want. Uh, and we do a lot of, of market research uh, to understand that further. And we've learned to speak our customers' language. Uh, and we've, uh, we've trained people at Merck to, uh, to instill a collaborative mindset in them. Uh, and uh, we've used the marketing uh, group throughout to help us uh, with that. And so we, we, we came up with, uh, with a, a worldwide branding for licensing at Merck. Uh, our uh, mantra is embracing partnerships, uh, our commanding claim, combining our strengths, sharing our successes. That's, uh, that's what we uh, sell as ourselves. Uh, and we try to make sure that our messages are uh, coordinated and, and consistent all, all around the world. Alliance management, you know, the, the, the deal doesn't stop when, when the ink's dry. That's when it starts. Uh, and we weren't paying attention to, uh, to that part of the business. We set up an alliance management group. I wish we'd done it years before. It's been terrific. Uh, as I said, we, uh, we realigned our incentives so that, uh, uh, so that uh, whether, an whether uh, a, a Merck drug comes from internal efforts or external uh, relationships, uh, if you are involved in the identification of that drug, you're going to get uh, rewarded. Uh, final thing we did was charm school. Uh, one of the things we discovered through our, uh, our surveys was that um, uh, our Merck scientists were enormously well uh, respected, uh, but their manners weren't. Uh, and uh, the, 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 some of our uh, interactions during due diligence uh, weren't, uh, weren't well received. So, uh, so we set up what we call a charm school. This is what we expect you to do when you go out on a due diligence uh, exercise. This is how we expect you to behave. Uh, and if you don't like what you see, and never forget that you're talking about someone else's baby here. Uh, and uh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you just have to say, you must be very proud. Uh, it had a huge impact. Uh, um, uh, we have found that we can get competitive advantage in the due diligence room now through these kinds of behaviors. In fact, it's been so impressive, one of the Merck scientists came to me afterwards and he said, this is really terrific, I love this, I wish we could be like this inside Merck. <laughs> so, uh, through, we've, uh, we've greatly increased the number of alliances uh, as a consequence of all these changes, uh, uh, actually over 250 deals in the last uh, five years. Um, uh, I'm not going to take you through all of these. These are some of the deals we did over the last year or so, some very important ones for us, uh, a relationship with Ariad in oncology for a phase three opportunity, two deals with a little company in Switzerland called Adex. We've been following that company since they were founded five years ago through our, uh, our local scout. A couple of acquisitions, a little biotech company with a beautiful product, cardiovascular product, going into phase three. Uh, technologies have uh, always been uh, very important uh, to Merck. Uh, we generally find that we can get uh, what we're looking for. And now uh, over 65% of Merck's revenue comes from, uh, from products which have at their base intellectual property which we derive from outside of Merck. So that's of uh, tremendous importance uh, to us. Uh, we never forget that uh, you know, we need to have that strong internal capability but that, that internal capability allows us to leverage this external innovation. Great case study, oncology. Merck is not an oncology company, hasn't been thought of as an oncology company. Uh, five years ago, we set out to build an oncology pipeline uh, and uh, um, partnering, uh, each of these uh, represent, oops, a part, represents a partnered uh, uh, drug on here. Uh, partnering has really been critical to us uh, to build what has now become uh, one of the leading early stage oncology pipelines uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. So we've got the, uh, the mindset, the organization, the people, uh, the processes in place to win. We have a, a system of very close uh, collaboration, rapid access and involvement of, of senior management, very clear and straightforward process. We uh, set uh, objectives and we continuously uh, prioritize and we're uh, very customer oriented. And we like to say, the world is our oyster. So uh, with that, I'll end and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, uh, thank you for sharing the revenue. Can you tell us what the net margin of the partnering and alliances has brought? 
No, I can't, I can't, gi I can't give you uh, specifics on that. Uh, uh, obviously, margins are uh, critical to, uh, to our business. Uh, uh, for us, I think you know, the, the, the best approach to keeping our margins uh, good in this business is actually to partner very early. So we absorb more of the risk. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, 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 we, we absorb the risk uh, uh, and uh, we pay less at an early stage and that helps us uh, keep our margins up. Of course, the corollary to that is that we have to accept that, uh, that we're going to have a higher rate of, uh, of failure. All, all in all, though, the, it is a profitable side of the Oh, thing. absolutely, yes, yes. Second question is, uh, uh, I noticed uh, uh, there was no, uh, at least a slide, uh, on genomic medicine. Yeah. Can you comment briefly on where Merck uh, might be headed yeah. or where, where sure. you are on yeah. genomic medicine? Yeah, absolutely. Our, our, uh, our oncology franchise is really predicated on the belief that uh, genomics holds the core to understanding uh, uh, where the next uh, generation of cancer drugs is, is coming from. Um, seven years ago, we bought a company called Rosetta uh, in Seattle. Uh, a, a really terrific genomics organization really focused on, uh, on RNA profiling at that time. Uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, incorporated uh, RNA profiling into all elements of our drug discovery process and into our uh, target identification. Um, uh, the, the work at Rosetta also led us into an understanding of the world of RNA uh, and that led us to the so-called small interfering RNAs and the acquisition of a company called Cerner. Uh, and uh, the objective there is to make small interfering RNAs as drugs against targets which perhaps aren't accessible through conventional uh, medicinal chemistry. Insights into those targets come from uh, genomic analysis. Yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit about um, whether or not you use scouting to identify um, opportunities for companion diagnostics and whether yeah. or not that's, a, that's an area of focus yeah. for Merck? Yeah, we've um, done a lot of work around uh, diagnostics. Uh, and to my previous questioner's point, if you're going to be in, in areas of in genomic medicine uh, and personalized medicine, then, then uh, we accept that you're going to have to have a diagnostic to uh, accompany it. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, usually that diagnostic arises from the tool set we use to identify the target. Uh, but we're, we're really, we, we, we can't be a diagnostics uh, company. Uh, what we've done instead is really set, given a set of guidelines to our scientists about how we would go about partnering uh, to produce a companion uh, diagnostic. This isn't something that's unfamiliar for us. Uh, when we got into the osteoporosis business with, uh, with Fosamax, uh, uh, there was no uh, diagnostic for a Fosamax. Bone mineral density as a, uh, as a, as a diagnostic was not uh, known or recognized. We partnered with companies producing uh, 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 bone mineral density uh, uh, information uh, to make sure that that information uh, was available at the time that uh, Fosamax uh, came to market. Uh, what about uh, research with uh, universities? Yes. Do you do quite a bit of it and how do you handle the intellectual property rights, especially when you don't know what's going to come out of the relationship a few years down the line? Yeah. How do you handle that part? And all I could see is relationships with specific partners around the world, but nothing open about it. Yeah. Open would be something that the entire community or the academia yeah. industry can benefit from yeah. your efforts, but yeah. I didn't see anything open in this. Great question. We do uh, collaborate with, uh, uh, with academic institutes. One on my slide, uh, uh, an arrangement with the Gladstone Institute in San Francisco where we're collaborating with them actually on a drug discovery effort in uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we also did a, a deal, two deals recently with, uh, with Harvard, one with uh, Laurie Glimpcher's Bone Biology Group. Uh, where she believes that her group has opened up uh, new insights into uh, uh, targets that modulate uh, uh, bone anabolism. Uh, we were able to work through the intellectual property issues there, uh, how we were going to assign uh, intellectual uh, um, property rights. Um, uh, actually, it was, uh, it was quite, uh, quite straightforward. The difficulty with academia for us is it's so vast, you know, uh, uh, and it's very difficult for us to patrol everything that's going on in the academic environment. The VCs have built up a, um, a formidable capability uh, uh, in that space. Uh, but where we can uh, and where we think uh, the opportunity is good, we will, um, we will participate. Uh, with respect to open innovation, it's, it's a great point. If we talk a lot about uh, uh, internally about what's competitive and what's, uh, what's pre-competitive. 
uh, and where we, where we should be trying to get competitive advantage and where we should be, uh, should be trying to be open. Uh, uh, and uh, actually, I would say that's a problem for the industry at the moment. One, uh, one of the areas that we are uh, trying to work on across the industry is how to use uh, surrogate markers to aid in the, in the registration of, uh, of new drugs. So there are several initiatives going on in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the pharma world working with the FDA uh, to try to qualify uh, uh, some new biomarkers uh, uh, as uh, surrogate endpoints for, uh, for discovery and registration of drugs. Um, I do think that, uh, that much of what we now consider um, competitive is going to become uh, pre-competitive. Uh, a lot of areas around, uh, around uh, pathway mining, uh, pathway analysis, uh, the genomic sciences, uh, that's just moving so fast that more and more of it is in the, uh, in the public domain and we're putting more and more of our research in the public domain. We, we do publish uh, very extensively. Uh, the Rosetta group is very deeply embedded with, uh, uh, with the academic community in areas of pathway mining, for example. Uh, I have two questions um, that are uh, about um, tactical tools that are probably pretty innovative for the pharma industry. Um, you mentioned how you scientists go to charm school and how you're very customer oriented. I wonder, uh, do you look forward and put scientists to go actually talk to doctors? Ah. That's one of my questions. And the other one is uh, whether you're uh, licensing scouts and scientists um, use social networking application, whether, you know, in-house or, yep. again, that openness. Yep. Uh, so uh, so with, with respect to talking to doctors, uh, actually, um, uh, I went out myself last uh, summer with, uh, with a Merck representative meeting, uh, meeting doctors in uh, uh, Canarsie in Brooklyn. Uh, I wanted to understand what it was like to be at that sharp end of the business, and uh, I'm glad I'm in the job I'm in, was the conclusion I came to. We, 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 have, uh, we, we had a meeting, really, a, a Merck-wide meeting, where we brought in a number of doctors uh, to talk to us about what it is that they're looking for us. This is all part of Dick Clark's uh, strategy to be much more uh, customer-oriented. The second question about... Um, uh, uh, network analysis, yes, actually. We bought a company some years ago called Comsort, uh, which had a, has a s set of uh, network analysis tools which we were using in the marketing organization. We brought them into research. We now use those network analysis tools to identify networks of interacting uh, uh, scientists working in areas of uh, interest to us, uh, and we can also use it to identify networks within uh, patent applications. So, so we, we put together those, uh, those uh, social network analyses, we provide them to our scouts, we provide them to our scientists, uh, and they use that information uh, to, uh, to uh, give guidance about where we should be directing our outreach efforts. Are your scouts dedicated full-time to scouting, or are they just serving part-time in that while they do other? 100% uh, uh, full-time scouting. So, so uh, we have one guy in... Uh, in, uh, in San Diego, uh, uh, he has an office and an admin in, uh, in San Diego. His job is 100% to live in the San Diego biotech community. I tell him in December, I don't want any more emails from him complaining about water spots on his BMW convertible. But, uh, <laughs> no. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So uh, uh, this, this trend towards what I call democratization of drug discovery, I think, uh, uh, will continue. We're seeing in India uh, a big movement towards uh, 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 ethical branded pharmaceuticals, uh, turning a lot of the capabilities that uh, uh, Indian chemistry has had in the generic space towards uh, uh, innovation, uh, especially as, as biology becomes more open source, in fact. Um, the, the corollary to that, however, is although uh, drug discovery has become uh, democratized, drug development has become a tyranny. Uh, it's become harder and harder and harder to, uh, uh, to get drugs uh, across the finish line because uh, the, the, the bar is getting higher and higher, both because of the uh, terrific generic pharmacopoeia and increasing uh, standards for safety and efficacy and, uh, uh, and uh, demonstrated economic ad ad advantage. Uh, I like to say that the difference between uh, research and development is that uh, in research, a surprise, a, 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 in, in research, a surprise is a discovery. In development, it's a disaster. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more surprises in, uh, in both of those uh, sectors. So we have to take advantage of the one and avoid the other. I, you know, uh, uh, well, I think the biggest ch change that was needed was um, uh, to, to provide an environment in, in which people would, could come forward with an idea uh, which might get rejected and they were congratulated for bringing forward the idea. Uh, as opposed to a culture where, if you, br and, um, you know, m most of our, most ideas in our business are bad ideas. It's just simple truth that uh, that 93% um, of our uh, drugs never reach the marketplace. Uh, uh, probably 98% of our ideas never reach the marketplace. You can have a lot of bad ideas, um, but. Uh, if, if you have an environment in which people bring forward an idea and they're told it's a dumb idea, they're not going to bring forward a second idea. So it was, it was really uh, instituting a, a mind shift at the top which said, uh, geez, I'm really glad you brought that forward. It's a great idea. Let's talk about it. Uh, even if we can't go there, we want you to come back with your next idea. Uh, and uh, uh, when people saw that, Yes, as I say, scientists love science. They love ideas. They're in the ideas business. Uh, so, so it quickly, became, it quickly uh, snowballed, I would say. Okay, thank you.